and many felt that they weren't getting it. We shall end as quickly as possible all the measures taken by the last administration to force local education authorities to reorganize their schools on comprehensive lines. Those who still have grammar schools, technical schools, smaller secondary schools may choose to keep them. Those who wish to stay comprehensive will also be free to do so. But they'll have the choice and they'll have the freedom and the parents will have the choice. Yeah, yeah. Because we shall ensure that parents' wishes are taken into account as far as possible in the choice of schools for their children. At least we shall enlarge the freedom. Yeah, Honourable yeah. gentlemen, yeah, 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 yeah. the Although the education service is often described as being free, it's really hardly free at all because it has to be paid for out of our tax-paying and rate-paying pockets, and the cost is significant. The average yearly cost of educating a child in primary school is now £324. In a secondary school for children below 16, it's £455, and in the sixth forms, £800 per pupil. The education service must be truly accountable to the parents and the taxpayers' wishes, and we shall see that it is so. We shall also extend the principle of choice in education by introducing a scheme to help talented children from less well-off homes to attend certain fee-paying schools. Their ability has entitled them to an education suited to their talents and they should not be denied it because of dogma. And we shall fight to improve educational standards. We shall have to make better use of our resources, and schools will need to have clear aims and pursue them with vigour. Greater choice and higher standards, those will be our aims in the education service. We shall also work to improve the use of resources in the National Health Service and to simplify its administration. Mr. Speaker, I expected that. The other side have been complaining about it for five years and have done absolutely nothing about it. Also, Mr. Speaker, I have great sympathy for the cause of small local hospitals and hospitals with a special role like the Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital. Here again, there is no such thing as a free service in the health service, and it must be made more responsive to the needs of the patients. And so in those ways, we shall extend choice and diversity, which have been diminished under the, during the lifetime of the last government. Douglas. 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 I'm very grateful to the Right Honourable Lady for giving way. She was talking earlier about real people. On Saturday, one of my constituents came to me in relation to choice and the health service. And she told me that a provision of a wheelchair for her husband, which has been prescribed for him, was frozen, awaiting the decisions of her government. Would she like to tell me what I, how I should reply to my constituents in terms of choice? I'm astonished the Honourable Gentleman did not get his constituent one before the election. Isn't yeah. it amazing that he should complain just afterwards? <laughs> I turn now to the third head, freedom under the law. In recent years, the government has tried to do too much it shouldn't do and failed to do what it should do. The people must be able to look to the state for protection from crime Otherwise, the whole basis of free society is in danger. They should also be able to look to governments to support the judges in their decisions. So the battle against crime will be pursued with relentless vigour and with total commitment. And that's why the very first action of the new government was to implement immediately and in full the recommendations of the Edmund Davis Committee on Police Pay. That was an earnest of our intention to back the police in the war against crime. We must have a strong and experienced police force. 
which will also bring forward proposals for strengthening the powers of the courts to deal with young offenders. Now, under I wonder whether she is going to come to what is an extraordinary omission, both in her manifesto and in the uh, Queen's speech, about the problems of the inner city, and in particular, would she describe what are her proposals with regard to the existing partnership schemes? Are they to be enlarged, as I believe is absolutely necessary, or what? Whatever the honourable gentleman's policies on inner cities, they clearly have not been successful. They clearly have not been successful. I have been talking for several minutes about small business, vital to inner cities, about education, vital to inner cities, about health service, vital to inner cities, about housing, vital to inner cities, and it is those policies which are far more likely to revivify the inner cities than the ones of subsidy, without consulting sufficiently the local people, which the Honourable Gentleman's Government was following. I would like to press the Right Honourable Lady on this issue of inner city one. policy. And does she not recognise that it is quite wrong to suggest that the policy that was initiated a year or a few months ago, to suggest that it, because we haven't seen results yet, is, is really not to give a proper judgment on a whole range of policies which the last government initiated? The Right Honourable Gentleman's Government has been in power for about 11 out of the last 15 years. His policies have had a very, very good time to be tested. And yet in those inner cities, very good time to be tested. Where you find poverty in inner cities, there you will find you've had socialist government for many, many years. Perhaps because the Right Honourable Joe, the Honourable Member's policies didn't give sufficient care and attention to the personal freedom and dignity of individuals who yeah. tried to impose the will of the state upon them yeah. when they wanted something totally different. Under this heading of the rule of law, I would like to deal with some of the law and trade unions which the Right Honourable Gentleman raised. We accept that a strong and responsible trade union movement must play a big part in our economic recovery. Government and public, management and unions, employers and employees all have a common interest in raising production, productivity and profits and improving real living standards for everyone. The crippling industrial disruption which hit Britain last winter under the last government had several causes. Years with little growth in production, rigid pay controls ending, high marginal rates of taxation, and the extension of trade union power and privileges through the two acts of 1974 and 1976 passed by the last government. We shall introduce a bill to make three changes in the existing law. First, the right to picket will be limited to those in dispute picketing at their own place of work. Second, we shall amend the law on the closed shop so that those arbitrarily excluded or expelled from any union are given the right of appeal to a court of law, a right which the last government took away from them. Existing employees and those with personal convictions against joining a union will be protected. If they lose their jobs as a result of the closed shop, they will be entitled to full compensation, compensation which they did not get under the last government. Yeah, 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 yeah. And thirdly, we shall provide public funds for postal ballots for union elections and other important decisions. Every trade unionist should be free to record his decision without others being able to watch or take note. We believe that the great majority of trade unionists will support these changes overwhelmingly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Right Honourable Gentleman made... Could the Prime Minister tell us, in that case, whether she's dropped the proposal for robbing the families of people on strike of social security benefits? <laughs>